Hi, Aliza. Hi, Bridget. Hello, ladies. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. hi. Hello. You look gorgeous today. Oh, like, thank you. <laughs> my 27th Zoom call of the day. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, we're just so appreciative that you're giving me time. Action. Oh, thank you. How are <laughs> you doing, Sakshina? How are you today? I'm good, Bridget. How about you? Besides, well, the 27th Zoom call. <laughs> I can't complain. I'm very grateful. I have many things to be grateful for. Hi, Alyssa. Alyssa, I couldn't hear you. I think you're still on mute. Sorry. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hi. <laughs> so uh, did you get your names pronunciations right? Is it Alyssa or Alisa? Alisa. Alisa. All right. Thank you for letting me know. Of course. Yeah. So Sakshina will be your moderator tonight. Um, she's brilliant. She's not going to ask. So many burning questions and <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing you've already sent the questions before to them, Jesse. So it's pretty much the rundown of the same drill. Yeah, we can improvise a little bit, you know. Oh, can I I think I might have not looked at it. I'm not gonna lie. So did you uh, Yeah, me either. I'm I, I I'm sure you no sent problem. something, but I should look at it now, probably. That would be a yeah, a great so idea. So let's see. Okay, here we are. Oh, look at this super organized panel. Yes, you have, this is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> These are really wonderful questions. It's very organized. Thank you, Jesse. No nice problem, time. yeah. Perhaps reviewed it. Very, very, very trademark, Jesse. Eight minutes, more than eight minutes for the panel. Forgive me. <laughs> You're good. Okay. Uh, Yvonne is here too. Hi, Yvonne. Hi, Yvonne. Hi. Hi. How are you today? Oh, here we go. Yes. Have to get all the cameras and everything set up right. Yeah, for sure. OK, we, uh, we're already having people coming in. But I think just before we start, just very quickly, here's Sakshina. We're classmates. She's an amazing person who've worked with lots of you know, development projects and with lots of development research centers, uh, including the World Bank. So she will be uh, kind of um, be part of this uh, fun and uh, fruitful discussion, I believe. And there's Yvonne. Um, Yvonne is a board member of a couple of NGOs, and she also had rich experience in uh, management in a corporates. So um, yeah, she's gonna bring in a lot more insights from the private sectors as well as NGO sectors. And then we have Alisa, Alisa, right? <laughs> Alisa is working with uh, Lark, Larkin, is that Larkin? Larkin Street? Larkin Street, exactly. So Larkin Street is one of the biggest NGOs that are working with homeless people and you know the, the housing issues. So um, Alisa has been working really on the forefront with the people in need. So I believe that she's gonna bring in a lot more insight um, from like the very front line point of view. And then we have Birgit and Birgit work with a very cross sector. I think you can definitely talk more about that with government, with startups, with businesses as consultant. And she herself is also an international coach and speaker. So very excited to have this panel of a very diverse background. Thank yeah. you. One quick correction is um, Birgit. Bridget, exactly. That's okay. It's like a J, like a. Yeah. What's the origin of the name? Bridget? Originally supposed to be French, Brigitte, but then my mother was yeah. in the recovery room after many, many um, drugs that she had for her Syrian C section birth. So she just pointed at a magazine for them to spell the name. And I think there was like a little lost in translation. So it got changed from Brigitte to Bridget, which in the end she was fine with it, but that wasn't her original. That wasn't the original idea. <laughs> That's quite the That's story. Wow. <laughs> quite interesting because my mom also, um, I'm named Yvonne because my mom took French in high school and really liked the name. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Sakshina, do you have a story behind your name? Well, I was not named Sakshina at birth. Uh, I was named Nieti, which translates to destiny in English. Mm. And 
uh yeah and then some somebody you know in india you have like everybody giving solicited advice and then some <laughs> relative just suggested no you should like no it leaves her own destiny to ambiguous you should change it and then sakshina finally is like another name for a goddess so oh wow well, if you're going to get a name it's to be named be named for a goddess yes, yes. not too shabby <laughs> <laughs> Um yeah so I love the discussion about name but <laughs> I also love to quickly walk everyone through the agenda for today so we're going to have a very quick 5 minutes about the introduction of like why we're talking about this and also the community itself um now we're going to have you know a very enjoyable 30 of actually 40 minutes about panel discussion and the last 15 minutes will be the Q&A so I want to give people you know enough time to interact Um, in case there is not enough questions, we can just keep on going, right? Sixteen, so I'm gonna brainstorm more questions, and I will be pre- pretending as an audience to ask burning questions. But I'm sure that our audience will be very engaged. <laughs> so enjoy the enjoy the show. And thank you for putting this all together, Jesse. It's it sounds like it's going to be really a, an interesting conversation. Yeah, in the past we had lots of you know panelists who have never talked to people from other sector like really in depth about the same problem, homeless issue for example. In Hong Kong we had people from NGOs and from church, um, and people from like data science sector and people who are you know in the city councils never really like sat down together to discuss you know why we're seeing this problem different way and what's what are the gaps need to be filled. So I believe this is very necessary. All right, we got me more people coming in. All right, Sakshina, do you want to um, crack your jokes? Uh, we start? <laughs> That's on the spot. Crack your jokes. <laughs> Just laugh. Yeah. You have a great laugh. Thank you. Um Yeah, so just to clarify, I think I will introduce Jesse first. Jesse will give an introduction about you know setting the agenda etc and then uh, as you can already see from her email i'll ask um, each of you to introduce yourselves and uh, then we'll just carry on the discussion from there oh my god sakshina george is here oh my gosh our program director is here too yeah. so background george is our pro- program director he also have like lots of years of experience in ngos and different Um, yeah, Peace Corps and consulting group, and I know Bridget wants to connect with him. So I think there's no better occasion than this. Oh wow, getting lots of people here. Um, I'm not let, letting them in the room yet. So if there's a final, you know, words or we should do like, <laughs> just to relax, <laughs> is the time. <laughs> All right, two more minutes. Oh my God, people are getting really early here. And also what's interesting is we're gonna have half of our, our audience from Asia because our main base is in Asia. So half in the Bay Area and half in Hong Kong and the greater China. So uh, I imagine will be very interesting. And it's 9 a.m. for them. So they must be really committed and pumped for this. <laughs> they got their coffee ready. Uh, we should check with them on that. <laughs> coffee or tea. Exactly, coffee or tea. All right. I think we can get started. And if you don't mind, this whole um, conversation is recorded. So we will also share with our partners and share our social media. Awesome. All right, are we ready? We are ready. <laughs> three. Ready as you're going to get, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, three, two, one. I'm just going to meet all the participants. All right, Sakshina, floor handed to you. Hello, everyone.
uh, those of you who just joined us, uh, if possible, um, do keep your video on. We'd like this to be as interactive as possible, and it's uh, well nice to talk to faces rather than just names. So, hi, George. <laughs> And also, can you type in the chat, where are you calling from, calling from? Because we know there are lots of audience are calling from Asia, and it's pretty early in the morning. So we want to make sure that you have your coffee ready. Yeah, but even, even from the States, looks like that there are a lot of people trickling in. And we understand that there is this other concurrent event that is hogging all the limelight. But... I think this is a good way for us to save uh, the people who are generally interested <laughs> in development. Um, but yeah, looking forward to lots of content with a lot of enrichment. Oh, Leila is calling from New York City. Hi, Leila. Hello. How did it feel late for you, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's nine, nine o'clock. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Hi, Dres. Hello. Hi, where Riz. Are where are you calling in from? Actually, I'm in Hong Kong. You're in Hong Kong. Right. <laughs> That's where this whole community has started. And <laughs> we have lots of more people in the same city with you on this call. Right. All right, Sakshina, why don't we get started? Um, All right. All right. So let's let's get started while others trickle in. So uh, firstly, thank you so much for being here, for taking the time out, uh, especially with God knows how many other events going on at this time. So we're glad that you chose to prioritize this one to start with. Uh, so as you all know, this event has been put together by Jesse who is also the co-founder of, who's the founder of uh, Impact Circles. So I'll let her uh, carry on with the introduction uh, before we start the discussion. Jesse, you Sure. Hi, everyone. How are you all doing? I know this is a super weird time. We usually have this meetup totally offline. And what we do is we go to some very local and grassroots area like slum, like homeless center and really sit down there with lots of entrepreneurs and um, investors and brainstorm solutions for those very hands-on problems. However, here we are, we're on Zoom. And you know, this conversation still carry on because of so many people with a passion um, are there to you know, keep this mission, um, keep on working on this mission. So essentially, what is Impact Circles? This is a new brand that we're launching before we start the community with um, this event platform called Social Entrepreneur Meetup. So we organize once a month a meetup events so that people can keep coming back to the platform and finding the people for collaboration. But now we've been doing so much more than just having the meetup events and networking. We're also offering the mentorship opportunities. So for you know, the young entrepreneurs or first time funders or social innovators um, to connect with the thought leaders and also the practitioners in the field. We also offer um, we also offer kind of like referrals. So if any partners or anyone is organizing their own events, we're empowering them to kind of build their own community with our network. So as we're launching a new brand, we're inviting more partners, no matter you're representing a community, um, university, or uh, incubator accelerator, we welcome you to kind of approach us to become a circle within our impact circles. So what we can do is we can guide the people who want to get started or want to get more like deep in the fields to kind of understand, navigate and connect with you for specific purposes. So that's basically what Impact Circle is about. And we're going to have our launch party next week. So you guys pretty much are the first audience who knew about this insider news about our brand launch. So um, thank you so much, Sakshina, for, you know, being moderating our panel and we have brilliant speaker today from very diverse backgrounds so i really hope everyone can enjoy the conversation and also keep in mind this is a co community we want to co-create 
So if anyone have any social issue you're particularly interested in, please come to approach us. We would love to co-create event with you, with the people you want to reach out, with the events, or with the topic you want to talk about. So yeah, hand it back to Sakshina and hope everyone enjoyed the conversation tonight. Yeah, thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, I think before we start, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves. So I think we can start with Elisa, Bridget, followed by Yvonne, so alphabetically. Always alphabetically. I always go first. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is Elisa Albi. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and an associate director of behavioral health and client practice with Larkin Street Youth Services in San Francisco. Um, and we work with homeless youth, um, aged homeless youth, usually 18 to 24, but we do have an underage shelter for youth um, from 12 to 18 years old. Um, I've worked in this field for about eight years. Prior to that, I worked in child welfare, um, but always in youth services. So my passion is really youth focused, mental health um, services. Bridget? Thank you. Hi, I'm Bridget Iarusso. I'm in West Berkeley, and I am a social impact business coach. I originally started in the nonprofit sector, but now I'm on a mission to help diverse entrepreneurs who have a service business or a business that wants to solve a social problem to scale their business with an impact model. So I look at where they're serving, who they're serving, how. And through the lens of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, we look at whether a business that solves a social problem is actually solving a social problem for groups that are historically marginalized or on the fringes versus just solving a business problem for people that are historically privileged and have a lot of access to capital, which is a traditional business model because it makes the most sense from a funding perspective, right? So I help a lot of entrepreneurs to look at balancing the scale by looking at how they can monetize an offering that is in fact designed to support people of privilege, but it also serves a group that doesn't have access and how to build a model that actually looks at beyond the triple bottom line, how you can look at the lens of equity and inclusion in that social enterprise model and make sure that we're not still replicating the same systems that we replicate in traditional capitalism in the social enterprise model. Um, I was an instructor at UC Berkeley for over eight years years in the entrepreneurial certificate programs at UC Extension. And I no longer work there because we fell into a place of misalignment in the way that I approached doing business because I'm really in the business of disrupting harm and bullshit in business. I take a stand. I don't candy coat things. I'm direct in my language and I use that language purposefully and intentionally because I believe that many of the social ills we experience are as a result of replicating, again, the same systems that historically have gotten us to the place of inequity. And most institutions, public institutions, are involved in replicating those systems, whether unintentionally or intentionally, and need to be a part in disrupting it. And so that's why I've chosen to do my work outside that institution, although I learned a great deal while I was there. Um, extension was a business and that was a business model that for me was in many ways broken because we served the top tier of individuals from countries where there were so many students that couldn't afford to access our programs and we needed to get innovative to figure that out and there was just a lot of re resistance around that and so I'm here to disrupt and also get us to get creative and think about how we can include and also be profitable and sustainable at the end of the day so thank you so much for having me I really appreciate this opportunity and thank you everyone for being here and there's so much going on tonight so i appreciate everyone that showed up agreed we all appreciate all of you showing up today i'm yvonne murray and i am a social innovation and community engagement strategist known for building community partnerships to solve shared problems i work on complex seemingly intractable issues establishing unexpected partnerships as groups discover and align on shared goals and objectives, working together to solve shared problems. I'm active on the board of three NGOs, a new group that has just started called Seeds Outreach Services, which focuses on services for homeless youth, the Grateful Garment Project, which is uh, nine years old and focuses on bringing, restoring dignity to victims of sexual violence, and Community Services Agency of Mountain View, which focuses on services to those who are most at of homelessness, food insecurity, and those types of issues. 
I spent the last 30 years building software products at various technology companies in the Valley. And I recently left the corporate world to focus full-time on social change. I believe better is possible when we work together to solve societal problems. And I'm excited about the discussion today because I think when we bring diverse sets of people together is when we can potentially talk about what the innovative solutions need to be. Uh, thank you so much to all three of you for firstly being here and uh, sharing the different backgrounds uh, that, you're, that you all come from. Uh, so Yvonne, since you mentioned about the societal problems, uh, my first question would be, uh, what societal problems have been on the top of your radar, uh, especially during COVID? And if your priorities like for you and your organizations have changed pre and post COVID? So Yvonne, we'll start with you, followed by Alisa and then Bridget. So I think there's a whole set of social problems that have become more complicated during COVID that people are really aware of. You know, the risk of homelessness, the risk of food and housing insecurity. We understand that a lot of the people who were not able to work from home are the people in the low rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. And, you know, it was a lot of the people who may serve our meals at restaurants or may be cleaning or our, our homes or cleaning businesses or maybe doing gardening. Those people, all of a sudden their income completely dried up. And in addition to that, racial inequities have been exacerbating during the pandemic, which I think is one of the many reasons that we see things coming to the surface that have needed to come to the surface for a long time. In addition to those social problems, which are more obvious to everyone, are less understood parts of the public dialogue. Issues of loneliness and social isolation, which particularly impact our seniors and other people who are at risk with health risks. You know, one of the um, uh, homeless shelters down here in, the, in San Mateo County has a set of people who are now, instead of at the homeless center, who are isolated in their hotel rooms. They're spending all their time in a hotel room with people literally coming and knocking on their door to drop off meals. And so there's a lot of social isolation that is going on in that. There's a lot of issues with people's mental health. We are all feeling a lot of extra stress with this pandemic. And it's hard for all of us to deal with, and particularly people who already have diagnosed mental health issues. In addition, the risk of abuse, both in domestic violence and child abuse have increased because in a lot of cases, these victims are being socially safe with their potential abuser. And so all of those issues are really, critical to resolve. And some of those issues, you know, we've seen with one of the nonprofits that I work with, that there's been a huge flood of donations coming in because they understand that the risk of homelessness and food insecurities needs to be addressed. But some of these other issues, the funds are actually drying up for at a time when there's a lot of need. Thank you, Yvonne. Alisa? Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. I think Yvonne has highlighted a lot of the really significant um, pieces that have been impacting, especially the community that I work with. Um, I think isolation is a huge piece. Um, we have seen a significant increase in overdose amongst our, the community that we work with. Um, you know, the isolation isn't just impacting mental health, it's also impacting substance use. Um, it's impacting where drugs are coming from, you know, we bring a harm reduction approach to substance use. Um, and one of the, the pieces of harm reduction is that you use with other people, but we're not allowed to use with other people right now. So that you're reducing one of the biggest um, factors that we use as a, a way of safety. Um, and just, you know, the social isolation. I mean, we're like Yvonne said, you know, we're struggling and many of us have family that at least we can FaceTime with and things like that. But many with young people that I work with don't are not connected with their families due to abuse, being kicked out of their homes. Um, you know, we work with a lot of LGBTQ identified youth who have fled other places in the United States because they're not safe in their own homes, particularly our 
um, trans youth of color. And so they are significantly impacted during this time because not only can they not see their friends who are their community and their chosen family, um, but they don't have a larger community to surround themselves with. Um, so that's been a big impact. And also I think people don't realize how um, the mental health care system has been impacted, not just in access to mental health care, um, but you know, when people went remote, you know, a lot of clients, they're not comfortable doing remote services. Um, we were surprised by how many that were willing to do that. Um, but you know, our clients that are high needs, that's not, it's not the, the safest more, most ethical way for us to work with them. Um, and then, you know, for clients who are experiencing mental health crisis, the hospitals are impacted. They don't want people who aren't, you know, in, they don't want to increase people's risks by going to the hospital if they don't need to. And so unless a client is like at imminent risk of committing suicide, they're not getting there. They may not even go to the hospital. And if they do, they're being released. And those clients then cannot access you know, longer term substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment, because the only access point at this point is through the hospitals. Um, and it's really, really, really challenging um, to get clients into the hospitals right now. Um, and for that, for us, that's been the biggest impact is um, we can't get clients preventative care right now. It's really challenging. Yeah, I think that that's spot on, uh, Alisa, especially the point about the lack of support system as well. Uh, Bridget, you're up. Thank you. So I don't want to um, be redundant with what Yvonne and Elisa already shared because they've really covered, you know, broadly the, the situation at hand in terms of all the different areas of the society where people are the most vulnerable being affected. I think from the work that I do being in the online business space, a lot of what I'm hearing and experiencing is just the family system overwhelm and the stretch, particularly parents with multiple generations where they're trying to care for elders, they have young children, they may or may not have access to adequate resources, they may be working or not working and just, you know, with a family system like my own, we are two parents with one child, we have privilege, we have access, we have resources, and we're overwhelmed and overstretched. When I think of a single parent that is also an essential worker, that has multiple children, that has to figure out childcare, that may have an elder, it really gets to a place where it's just kind of, um, it's just not tenable. It's just not manageable for most people of any economic means. And then when you bring the lens of equity and, and, and racial parity around these issues, you see where people are most affected and most overstretched stretched. And in the entrepreneurial sector, I see a lot of practitioners who are really powerful healers that have a social business model that have been doing grief recovery or grief coaching or trauma informed coaching, which is so important for people during this time, their capacity to even do the work is limited for themselves. And the number of people that need their help is growing. And so you know, while all these challenges are imminent and there's a lot of inequity when it comes to technology, we have to figure out how to get people access because ultimately it's the only way that they can access services right now. So just feeling that challenges are there, they're, they're quite large, but there are people looking at innovative solutions and ways of doing this work. And I think that the biggest thing that I'm seeing right now is the impact of collective grief and collective trauma with all the different events that are going on and just the kind of recurring health issues that communities that are marginalized already are experiencing that are compounded and just the need for not only traditional services but non-traditional services like those that my clients provide that are more spiritual healing or or non-traditional um medicine or um, non-traditional coaching grief coaching and how do we make these things accessible to people that don't have the means to pay for not only their basic needs but these types of services um, because they're so very important. So right now I see the biggest challenges, you know, the, the income gap growing, unemployment is a big issue. People are, are moving toward alternative ways of, of making money. A lot of people are trying to build an online business or pivot into a new way of doing their business. And there are a lot of hurdles for them. You know, here in Berkeley, we have the Chamber of Commerce trying to do things with local businesses, get them up to speed. Some of these places didn't even have a website or an e-commerce site or a way to just even keep their doors open. And these businesses are so critical, not only for their own families, but for the local economy, just to keep things moving here. So 
all those things from where I sit as, a, as an entrepreneurial coach are the things that I'm thinking about and how do we start to redistribute resources? Because the problem is not that there are no economic resources in the system. In fact, there are more economic resources in the system as a result of the boom in medical pharmaceutical sales and technology booming as a result of the need. So there's money in our system and there are resources. They're just in a few sectors that are concentrated. So the biggest challenge I see is figuring out how to move those resources out of those sectors into the sectors that are most needed. Thank you, Bridget. And thank you, Jesse, for spotlighting the four of us. Um, so moving on, uh, the next question I have is a two part one. So the first being, uh, how have you firstly combated this demand for uh, increasing demand for public services in the vulnerable communities? And second, how do you strike a balance between business sustainability and commitment to beneficiaries? Uh, and in this case, I think we can start with uh, Bridget first, followed by Yvonne and then Elisa. Yeah, so the, the work that I do historically is one of those um, industries where there is natural inequity. People that can afford business coaching are those that tend to be able to invest to do better. And so one of the things that I've looked at is reimagining the business model of coaching and looking at it as an impact model or a pay it forward model. So in my own business, I've created a, a situation where people of privilege that can afford to pay, my, pay for my services are actually paying a premium to work with me, knowing that they're paying into an impact fund, which then would provide sponsorship for either pro bono coaching services or access to my programs at a sliding scale rate so that um, individuals from groups that historically have less access to resources can still get my support uh, community education to help them with their businesses. So it's one of the things that I'm personally on a mission to do because what, my industry in particular, again, because of the growth of the online business space is one of the fastest growing industries. It's a billion dollar industry. And um, there are a lot of people of color in my industry that are actually experts and are industry leaders, but they're not necessarily seen as such in my space. And so a lot of what I'm doing is kind of supporting people to shift the narrative around who do we look to as thought leaders? Who do we look to as experts? Who are we learning from? And then how do we create opportunities to ensure that we're not, again, replicating the same system of serving people at the top and then folks who are, are those that have just less access, but they don't necessarily have less possibility or less innovation or less creativity. They just don't have resources. How do we ensure that those people are not left out of the situation or left out of the game? And so, um, for me, sponsorship is a really critical model that I'm bringing in, and that allows me to be sustainable as a business. And then the idea of impact investment, which is that some people have the means to invest in things that are for their own betterment, for their own uh, advancement, but that those investments can actually pay it forward. So it can still have a win-win at the end of the day. Um, and so it's very much different than a nonprofit model and it's much more sustainable because we're looking at where is capital, who has capital, who's already spending money, who's already buying solutions, and then how do we appeal to that sector through the lens of um, the social issues that are going on, people do care about them, but they don't actually know where or how they can create an impact. They're often donating to organizations that they don't really know about. They don't know what the overhead is. And so companies can actually do a great job of making it very easy for individuals to invest in something and see exactly where the money goes. But it requires a lot of transparency and fiscal responsibility and integrity to do it right. Um, and then you fall into the danger of companies that are seemingly having a social business model or pay it forward model, but it's really just a PR or a branding or a marketing ploy for that company to get more attention on what they do, but they're not actually paying it forward in a significant way or not creating enough accountability and transparency around what they're doing. So that's really one of the ways that I'm, that I'm thinking about this. And again, you know, if you, I follow a lot of great people, but one woman wrote a book that I'm particularly fond of called The Soul of Money, and her name is Lynn Twist, and the book is really about the root cause of poverty is not poor people not having enough. The root cause of poverty is wealthy people having the fear and scarcity that they're never going to have enough, so they just keep acquiring more, and the, the necessity of breaking that cycle starts with the wealthiest people in the equation and getting them to understand that there are enough resources to go around and that we've unfortunately bamboozled into thinking that there aren't. 
Um, so that's just a lot of what, what's on my mind these days. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, Yvonne? Yeah, so I think um, that was a great lead in what um, Bridget had to say. I, um, because I'm working directly with the different NGOs. And I'll start with uh, Community Services Agency of Mountain View. What we saw is it was really clear to the large companies in Mountain View, main one being Google, and the Mountain View um, City Council that there were some serious issues that needed to be addressed. So the City Council put together, uh, funded a, a substantial amount of money to help with rent relief and Google participated in that. And then they're using CSA because they have the infrastructure and they work with these clients as the group that is administering the funds and really helping bridge the gaps for all of these clients who are in distress. That's working really well. And that's an example where um, the NGO can't do it on its own, but by having a par partnerships and collaborations, it can work really well together. Uh, if I look at, for example, Grateful Garment Project, it is an example where money has dried up and there are there is still a need. So they're still sending out services to the various agencies that they work with who, who work directly with the victims. And what we're actually needing to look at now is a different funding model, right? And how can we start to focus on funding models that don't rely on individual donations coming in, but how can we step into the social enterprise space? How can we rethink what we're doing? And so that, would, that could involve like working with people who are on this call and who are innovative and wanna like think about a new and different funding model or like how do we work with organizations who care about this space and want to be more than just a, a, a donor or because you can't, like there are too many nonprofits in this time of COVID that have gone under because they were heavily relying on grants and suddenly the grants in their space dried up because they needed to be funding another area. So I really think working together between NGOs and corporations and private citizens and investors and people who have a startup mentality to figure out how to shift from the models we've had for so long to one that is more sustainable for the organizations is really important. Thank you. Elisa? Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't really speak to our collaborations with, um, you know, larger, larger companies and things like that. I don't want to work on our development team, but, you know, for us going to telehealth was our big switch. Um, we've always provided in-person services. Telehealth was sort of the, we have a three year strategic plan and that was part of the third year of the strategic plan. Um, and then come March, all of a sudden, like we were online within a week of working remotely. Um, and we're back to kind of joint um, telehealth and in person for our clients that are high needs. But, you know, that was definitely a learning curve for us. And, and you know, for the most part, our clients have had access to the technology needed. Um, but again, we are the the clients that we serve for um, individual therapy are primarily in our housing programs, um, and so they are a little bit more stable. But our youth that access our community center and our drop-in centers who um, are unstably housed um, or homeless, they the lack the access technology isn't the same. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest areas that we're seeing that. Moving forward, I mean, we foresee beyond COVID times that we will always have joint telehealth and in person, um, just given how the future probably will look. Um, and so that's a transition for us is making sure that, um, you know, as we apply for grants and as we build our contracts with public funding, that we're considering the technology piece um, and how we're moving forward. Um, because that was definitely not something that was on the radar for us. You know, we build as as social workers, our big thing is like we build rapport. We want to be in person with people. That's how we've always worked. And so for us, this is a very different way in how we practice. Um, and so and also we um, are something that's unique about us is that 
We don't bill for Medi-Cal, um, which is pretty unusual for a behavioral health department and a nonprofit. Um, and the reason that we choose not to use Medi-Cal is because we want to meet our clients where they're at. Um, and that means that not all our clients are ready to go into individual therapy and meet with a therapist once a week for, you know, for 60 minutes. That traditional idea of therapy in an office doesn't work for them. Um, and so we want to be able to provide services like groups and drop in and just kind of like sometimes just meeting our clients on the street and having a conversation and walking around the block with them. Um, and so this model allows us to do that because we're not constrained by having to diagnose and having to do certain types of paperwork. Um, and so we can meet those groundwork, but that also means that we have to continue to share out why this model is important um, because as as um, Yvonne said, like people, nonprofits are struggling and financially struggling. And so, you know, one, we hope to be able to maintain this model and not have to bill for Medi-Cal because we can serve clients in any way that meets their needs. Yeah, I, I think this really sort of begs the question, right? Like Bridget mentioned that the, there's a dearth in economic resources which are not present within the government infrastructure of uh, social safety nets. And then Elisa, you just mentioned uh, telehealth and how generally, even in developing economies, it's generally the private sector that is able to fill these uh, uh, gaping holes, uh, which somehow the government is unable to uh, do. So I think my next question is, what are the most significant gaps in your respective regions uh, when it comes to resilience building? And, and what are the policies that put in address gaps? And I think we'll for this. So Alisa, you're up. Thanks. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, sorry, I don't feel like I had enough, totally enough time to think about the, the answer, but I think, um, you know, I think we have, I think it's a broader conversation of rethinking substance use treatment and mental health across and what healthcare looks like in America. I think that's the bigger picture um, for us because everything, you know, it all trickles down to how we can engage with our youth. And, um, you know, if we can't get them access to longer term supportive services or higher level of care than we can provide, then we're just, you know, we're just holding, like trying to build the scaffolding as much as we can and holding it in place. But um, we really need those larger systems to have the impact in, to build that infrastructure in um, for, for us to really be able to support our youth and, and create a resilient system for mental health care and substance abuse treatment. Um, Bridget? So um, I think a sector that I'm looking at keenly and when it comes to um, policies and taxation is the cannabis sector. It's another one of those um, now becoming very um, viable and um, profitable corporate sectors that once again has the potential to support marginalized communities or further increase the gap. So the cannabis industry starting out was um, diverse and now it's become again classically uh, people of privilege at the top of the, up the food chain. There's a lot of money generated and there's a lot that's taxed and there are a lot of this taxes, these taxes are in funds that have yet to be clearly allocated like for what are they going to be used and it's one of those examples where just thinking about how we tax corporations at the top of the food chain right now, whether it's cannabis industry or technology, um, we can actually designate where that money goes <laughs> strategically and it could be used for treatment for communities that are lacking in access to alternative treatment. I mean, this is one of the issues with cannabis is that cannabis was criminalized and crippled communities of color. And now that very same cannabis is decriminalized and it's helping people of privilege get further ahead. And so it's one, one of those spaces where I do think the government actually has to get involved and think about the historic inequity behind the industry and how do we actually um, put into place measures that correct those historic inequities. Um, and there's a lot of corruption, in, unfortunately, in the technology space, in the corporate space. And we live in a country where the tax status was not designed to serve all. Um, it very much does protect people at the top tiers of financial um, wealth and income. And people with corporations know this and they know how to shelter their money. And people that are hardworking um, don't have access to those same shelters for their money. And so I think it's a combination of 
um, education and educating people around what is available and then lobbying for changes in taxation policies that continue to punish people that are at the working class and middle class. And it's not about penalizing those at the top of the pyramid. It's just about um, supporting shifts that make it more equitable and more, more just. And I think that again, it's not for a lack of resources. It's a lack of resource distribution. And we need a government that's willing to take the action to make measures to shift the taxation laws that are further widening the economic gap in this country. And I don't think there's any getting around that because unless those changes happen at the top, we're really struggling with these Band-Aid solutions, but the problem is, is there and it's imminent and it's getting worse because again, during this crisis, some people are actually doing better than ever and other people are doing worse. And that's just, it's just growing. And so um, let's vote. <laughs> that's all I have to say on that. Let's vote. If you're I don't. in this country. Uh, Yvonne. Thank you. So I think Alyssa and Bridget both brought up really significant, really important issues. I think the reality is that the number of significant gaps and the number of things that need to be worked on is mind boggling, right? And no one person no one governmental social service can solve those problems. We can't rely on the government. We can't rely on any particular group to solve everything or really importantly, to even figure out what the right solutions are. And so that's where I think that community engagement, grassroots activism is a really important part of it, right? Uh, so I've been working really closely with a lot of groups in the community and, you know, they've been like, I just spent um, October 5th through 11th in the Mountain View Los Altos area was a week that we called Compassion Week. And over the course of that week, we had 120 some volunteer opportunities across, across a really wide range of nonprofits, a really wide range of social issues that we're, we're dealing with. One of the things that really excited me was we had five different um, NGOs that we were working with that were started by high school students. And so one of them was around um, teaching art to elementary school and um, middle school kids, and then taking the art that they had produced and taking it to senior homes so that the, to help combat the loneliness of the seniors. You know, there was, um, there was another uh, opportunity with a group called um, Rhythm in Motion where they decorated recorders that were then sent to um, kindergartners from a local school that's in a very economically depressed area. And there were a lot of also a lot of uh, different projects that were focused on some of the more traditional nonprofits. The, point really is, I think, that instead of like being in our social bubbles, like, you know, I worked in tech for a long time and saying, okay, I work in tech, I'll do my donations and get my matching grants from my company, to really start to understand the problems in my community, really listen to the people impacted, and start to talk to them about what how, how do we start to solve these problems instead of putting band-aids on them? And how we start to work with the people who are impacted and help develop long-term sustainable solutions. That's really what we need to do in terms of resiliency building is to start to establish something where all of us care about everyone else in our community. And when we see a problem that needs to be solved, we figure out which one of those we're going to step into and help to solve. Yeah, thank you for this, Yvonne. And I think it's quite wonderful that even after working for 20 plus years in the tech industry, and then eventually you just say grassroots is actually the solution. And I feel like that that's so um, very representative of this panel. And moving on, I think my next question would be that how do private, public, and nonprofit sectors complement each other. And if any of you has seen very successful examples of a nexus formed between the three that has worked very well. 
And for this, I think we'll start with Bridget, followed by Alisa, and coming back to Yvonne. Yeah, I think I have had the pleasure of seeing some pretty strong social innovation collaborations and partnerships. Um, one is a good friend of mine, Ruben Hernandez. He's um, he works with people who have money, who are venture capitalists that are looking to grow their wealth to invest in really tiny startup companies in Chile in remote indigenous villages and communities where they're looking at ways to to um, resell firewood and sell local goods and um, he's built partnerships here with investors in Silicon Valley and he's working with Mapuche leaders in Chile and they are actually turning an investment they are seeing profits um, he's getting more investors. He actually reached out to me yesterday and said, Bridget, are you ready to invest in the fund? It's a $100,000 minimum over three years. And I was like, I'm not quite yet. I'm not quite yet there yet, but my goal is to get there next year. Um, so I do see a lot of social innovation in the investment VC sector. Um, not enough, right? So Ruben is one of three black and brown folks in the space of, of venture capitalism that are really working to again disrupt the model of what venture capitalists are investing in but those partnerships are happening um, i've seen some really interesting partnerships happening in the space of uh, addressing homelessness and trying to disrupt the cycle of um, big companies coming in to build low-income housing which is just another terminology for a great business model for um, companies to build properties and make more money um, and those properties are rarely accessible um, to folks in any case and they often remain empty. Um, so I've seen some great partnerships around um, trying to break the financial barriers to um, getting more people to come together, individuals crowdfunding for investments to purchase properties. Um, a lot of my clients are disrupting the patterns. My client, Michelle Tamesh, has a crowdfund um, platform where she gets into local uh, communities and works with communities to buy back businesses and properties through crowdfunding and crowd investing. Um, there is a lot to be excited about, and, and we just need people that have a social heart, a nonprofit heart, and, and a business mindset to get really creative and innovative and think about who are all the players in the systems? I mean, I've looked at people having conversations with local Berkeley police and homeless organizations and Caltrain and really trying to get people to understand that the problem of homelessness is a heartbreaking human problem. Like nobody wants to see human beings live like that. I'm sorry. Like I live here and I get really emotional because I have a six year old and we walk down the street. And my little girl wants to understand like why people are like this. And it really pisses us off, right? Because there is a solution. It's just people are afraid. They're stubborn. They're stuck. They're used to this like churning the old mill of like the same crappy government solutions and putting band-aids on it. And like, it's going to take people that are innovative, that are willing to take a risk, that are willing to invest in a solution that is outside of the box. And we're not going to know all the answers, but you know, part of it is coming together and building out the best minimum viable product, building out the best possible potential way to solve the problem and starting to take action. And so it takes people in the system that are energized, that are disruptive, that are willing to push the conversation and get people to think outside of the ways that they're normally thinking about these problems. Because it's not to denigrate, you know, all the amazing organizations like Alyssa's and all the groups that Yvonne supports that are there, that are, that are stemming the, the bleed. The people are just bleeding and they need help in the moment. But we need people thinking about the bigger systemic issues and how do we fix that, right? Like the housing crisis is out of control. Rents are through the roof. And again, it's not for lack of, of resources. There is enough money in the investment space. There are places and spaces to build. And, you know, there are some local folks here on city council, Alex Schrenko, Terry Taplin, that are my friends that they're really, they're coming in with young energy and enthusiasm, and it's hard. It's an uphill battle. People want to keep doing the same things. And so we need to look at who are the people in the system that are innovating. We need to build partnerships with people that are disrupting and innovating. And above all else, we just need to get really creative, and we're going to need to take some risks and step out of our comfort zone to solve some of these problems. And I'm here to be a sounding board. I, I do pro bono advising and coaching for social entrepreneurs that are trying to disrupt the homeless issue, for example. So if anyone's working on a homeless solution and don't have access to resources, I'm happy to give you space to try to figure these things out. I know it's complicated. Um, but if we get enough people at the table around these things, um, we, we, there is a solution. There is. I know there is. 
Yeah, thank you for that offer, Bridget. And I hope that there will be some people who might take you up on that. Um, let's move to Alisa. Well, I think Bridget talked a lot about a lot of the really main, the main pieces. I think, again, I'm not come from a development place. I'm coming from the ground, working on the ground. Um, and so I, you know, I don't always necessarily see the bigger picture um, uh, groups that are coming together. And, uh, but one thing I, you know, one thing I do think about is like, we, there was a, there's a group of tech workers who've come together to create a constantly updating referral guide for homeless services in the city of San Francisco. Um, and so they volunteer to do it. They volunteer their time. Um, but it's really beneficial for those of us who work on the ground because, you know, they're, they're constantly, they're actually reaching out to clients who actually are on the ground and giving tips from clients like, hey, you know, you should be at the GA office at this time by so-and-so in order to actually get through the process, you know, like actual tips from people who are on the ground doing the work. Um, and they're constantly updating it, which is really helpful because so often, you know, all you're trying, you're sitting in an office with a client and all you want to do is solve a situation right then and there and come up with a resource and have access. But you go on these websites and some of them are, you know, 10 plus years old or they don't have the updated times and information. And so that's a really key piece for us is that like organ, that, you know, companies are working with nonprofits and those on the ground to really make sure that we're like, things are getting up to date and the technology that we use is up to date. Um, you know, I, we live in the tech world and I can tell you the technology that we use is very behind. I mean, the, the system that we use to do our case notes is like the worst creation in the world. Um, and so things like that, that could be revamped to help make the job on the ground easier, I think for us would be an amazing piece. And I think, you know, I, I appreciate every donor who, you know, gives to our agency and our, um, I think, I worked in a lot of nonprofits and I used to work um, in child welfare. And I think, you know, one of the things I always notice is, is our clients, um, you know, I used to work in group homes and, and housing programs and um, clients always feeling like they were in a fishbowl, like donors are just looking in on them versus like being a part of them and building a community. And so I think when anyone ever is trying to think about, I want to donate, I want to give, I want to be a part of something thinking about how you can be a part of that community and not just, you know, treating it as a fishbowl of you looking in um, and solving the problem and really bringing the community into the solution. I think that's what works um, with that referral guide is the community is part of it. They get jobs out of it. They can provide, you know, they're also letting other um, people experiencing homelessness know about the, about the service guide. Um, and so I think that's a key piece is, is really, and also asking, you know, thinking outside of the box of projects, you know, I think, especially working in youth services, you know, um, you mo obviously people want to give to youth and we want people to give to youth, but also thinking of things like the staff, you know, some of our staff, they drive from Modesto to get to the job, to work in a nonprofit, you know, they have families, they have children, they're commuting two hours. So in addition to thinking about the, the those that are being served, also those are who are serving the clientele and making them sustainable because, you know, and I appreciate we had a donor last year who, who gave a donation just for us to build a staff wellness project um, so that we could redo, you know, we could do something at the holidays for staff. We could redo our lunch area or, you know, break room so that we could actually have a place to sit and have lunch and have community um, and that's important too, is really thinking just not just like, this is the one thing I'm giving to, but what other things in an organization or in a, or in a problem could you think about it in a different way? I think that's a fantastic summary of uh, uh, just, you know, mainstreaming and community integration in, into the perspective. And especially in times like these, where you think, you, you know, you know what exactly you're doing, except that you don't, and it throws everything off. So these are the times when you actually realize the, the importance of this, uh, Yvonne. So, uh, you know, I think that um, things that um, Bridget and Alyssa brought up are super important. I think that Alyssa's example of the uh, referral guide that's constantly updated with uh, tips from people on the ground 
super valuable and something that, you know, a group of people said, hey, this is important. We're just going to go out and do it. There are also, a, like, you can look at the what companies are doing right now and thinking, oh, that's really great. And it is good. At the same time, I think that to Bridget's point, we need to disrupt the systems. You know, it's great that a lot of the tech companies will do pro bono projects with various nonprofits that help them along, but there are bigger systematic issues that need to be addressed that we can't address just with the on the ground grassroots activities. And so I think what we're what I was excited about from this meeting was getting people from very different contexts and very different focuses and very different interests to come together and say, how can we fix these bigger sy systematic issues? How can we disrupt the systems? How can we start solving the problems? So I would really challenge everyone on this call to think about how you can risk something big for something good that we can start to tear down these systematic problems. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I guess the next question would be, um, what in your opinion has worked best to mitigate the damage uh, done by COVID? And if there has been any initiative of late that has made you more optimistic about the whole situation? And in this case, I think we can again, uh, Maybe start with you, Yvonne. Got it. So um, I think we are far from the point of being able to start mitigating the damage from COVID. I think we are still in the midst of the long drawn out trauma and the hard work of getting through this extended pandemic. So. Uh, at this point, I, I, I don't think we're anywhere near starting to focus on how we start to rebuild. And I think it's really important to realize that all of the people who are working in the most critical places, to Alyssa's point, they need those of us who are not in one of those in one of those places to be like figuring out how to help them sustain for the long time, how to prop them up. How do we make sure that all of the people who are doing the really critical work with all of these different groups of people who are really vulnerable, how do we make sure and both sustain the vulnerable people and that work over time, but how do we make sure and sustain the people who are on the front lines? Um, and at some point, we'll get to the point of being ready to start talking about rebuilding, but I don't think we're there yet. All right. Uh, what do you think, Bridget? Can you share the question again? Yeah, I've typed it on chat as well. Uh, I've asked what has worked best uh, to mitigate the damage that has been done by COVID and if there has been any initiative of late that has made you more optimistic of the situation. Oh, boy. That is a difficult question to answer. You know, I, I want to be optimistic. Um, I do see pockets of collaboration and um, spaces where people are looking at things. But, um, you know, I can't pretend that I'm not frustrated and disillusioned by the situation that we're in with our current administration and how it's really crippling our ability to take the steps that are needed to even implement the innovations and the solutions that are coming to the forefront around testing and tracing and really ensuring that we can manage this crisis. I think that the only hope that I have is in the hands of um, the public in terms of the level of uh, activism and education that I've seen following George Floyd's murder, following this pandemic. I mean, one of the things that continues to invigorate and inspire and motivate me is just seeing everyday people take to social channels and take a stand for issues and educate and share their experiences and their stories. And, you know, for me, I feel like any of us that have access to social media, that have a platform, that have a following, we can all be um, 
levers for social change. I mean, one of the things that I'm taking on personally as, as a white presenting woman is I'm speaking to other people of privilege about what role they can play in disrupting the system, in um, doing their part to address the systemic issues that are going on um, in terms of racism, in terms of um, the way that they're voting and what what's influencing how they think about this election. And, you know, just tr constantly trying to <sighs> mitigate or course correct the level of misinformation that we're bombarded with on the internet, which is so much a part of the problem. And so I think everybody can play a role in that way in, um, just taking a stand for things, getting out, speaking to people and um, ourselves taking personal responsibility right now is such an important thing. And, and at, at the end of the day, also, we have to take care of ourselves. You know, I, I wanna kind of use this opportunity because Yvonne spoke so eloquently to this. I kind of just really wanna remind us all, those of us that are in the space of social work, social innovation, um, providing services, working in organizations that are on the front lines. So we really, as much as we want to give and give and serve, we have to take care of ourselves because when we're not well, then we actually further um, put, put pressure on the system and our family systems and things like that. So we have to put ourselves first, take care of ourselves, take care of each other and, and, and build relationships with other people that are like-minded so that you feel energized and don't get depleted. Surround yourself with other people that care about the issues that you care about and build broader and larger and more diverse coalitions because we have a greater impact when we do things together and we do go further faster together. And I really believe in that motto. And I think it's what's needed is finding ways to get people to come together and politics divide, unfortunately. And that's why we're so divided because everything's very politicized. And I'm, I tend to be political myself and I'm really working on it because we really have to shift to talking about core values and a shared vision for the world that we all want and then help people get creative in thinking about how do we get there? And that the path to get there might be different than the path that they're thinking. But if we wanna to get to the same place, maybe we can figure out how to work together to get there in a way that might not be what we're used to. So. Um, that's all I can really think of to add to that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bridget. Um, Alisa? Um, thanks. I think Bridget and Yvonne brought up a lot of the things that I also have feeling. It's, it's sometimes hard to find, um, to see the hope, but I think what I see is in the community building that's happened. Um, I think communities in some ways have really come together. And for me, working with youth services, like this is why I love working with youth because, you know, youth really empower me to keep doing this work. Um, you know, even just the small successes, but just their passion and their, their questioning and their challenging and they're asking like, really important of like, how do we disrupt this system? Like, this isn't working for me, this hasn't worked. Why are we still doing all of this um, in this way? And I think that's what, you know, that's what keeps me going every day is the young people that I work with um, and the possibility that they, they and communities that are impacted, I think that's the biggest piece is making sure that any, any social problem that we're trying to address that the communities that are directly impacted are a part of that conversation. That it's not, it's not people, like I said, looking in and looking down on the situation. It is those in the community giving peer voice, giving community voice is, a bit, is important. Um, and I think continuing to do that is how we go into whatever, hopefully, I, not going back to normal, but whatever our new normal is post-COVID, post this election, post um, many things coming in the future. Yeah, thank you for these nuggets of wisdom. And I think that would be my last question is any parting advice for the audience who I think a majority of us are entrepreneurs or social impact enthusiasts on how to get involved. So anybody's uh, free to take this up first. Just get out of your own head and let go of any fear and hesitation around it. The best way to get anything done is just surround yourself with people, share your ideas, get out there, do customer discovery, interview people, talk to people, build relationships, be relentless in your curiosity and all kinds of opportunities can emerge when we're just really authentically connected on making those human connections and don't worry about perfectionism get out of your head get out of self-judgment you know it's more important the impact and the outcome than the way you get there it doesn't have to look fancy you don't need a website you don't need to worry about it you know just just 
surround yourself with people like that have that same level of innovation and energy and just go for it you know and and if you're going to try something do your very best to get informed around what you're launching IDEO has a beautiful human design um, discovery method that is all about using empathy and curiosity and iteration and really just like playing with things and so much of social innovation is just about um, trying things and, and, and then tweaking them and trying something else and we have to get out of the zone of needing to be comfortable and looking polished and being a certain way it disrupting those things is so much a part of really being an entrepreneur so if anything's holding you back. Um, work on your mindset, think about, you know, what's the fear, what's the limiting belief, and then really start to like, lovingly call BS on the story, like say, is that a true story? Is that actually going to happen? Will I fail? Or is that just nonsense? You know, what would happen? What's the best thing that could happen if I did it? You know, you, you don't actually know until you try. And experience is our best teacher. We all have make mistakes, we have to fall down, we have to get up and we have to keep trying. And when you fail, just let it go. Learn from the lesson and don't beat yourself up. Look at the lesson as the opportunity. And, and again, just, just keep asking questions. I, I'm, I'm successful in business, not because I'm some type of genius or I knew things. I'm literally like, I'm successful because I'm so annoying. I asked like a million people, a million questions. I was like walking around asking everybody, how do you do this? How do you grow a business? How do you scale? How do you get to the next level? How did you do that? How did you do the marketing? How did you do that? And I would get answers, right? And that's how I would really start to, to forge my own path forward. So yes, some things you have to figure out on your own, but also take a look at how much are you trying to figure out on your own. And if you're really trying to do everything by yourself, that's the first cycle to disrupt. Ask for help, get people around it, get partners, find mentors. There's so many great people out there that are willing to help you. Yes, you might have some people that reject you at first, but you're going to find your people and you're going to get help and you're going to find your, your community around your idea. So just, just keep doing what you're doing and, and don't get disillusioned when things don't go your way right away. That's my best advice. That's great advice. And um, it, I think it's great advice because it's the advice I always give people as well. I think in addition to that, I really encourage people when they are being empathetic, when they are trying to solve these problems, that they are not solving problems for the people who are impacted, but they are figuring out how to bring the people who are impacted into solving the problems together. And that is really a part of what the whole ideal philosophy is. You need to understand you really need to understand empathetically the situations that you're solving for. It's different, like from my position of privilege, a lot of things that I would otherwise think would work are not going to work for people. I think it's particularly important when um, those of us who are not homeless may be looking at, oh, the homeless situation, and we think it's an easy solution. It is often not because people are often dealing with an intersection of a lot of different issues. But I think as Bridget said, do something, start, find other people who have the same fire in their belly for the issue, who share your passion, do something and then evaluate that, adapt, learn from what you did and continue to expand. Um, I would just have to add, because I think both of them both put it beautifully um, and Bridget, you took curiosity right out of my mind. Um, you know, in social work, we often go with curiosity, explore, expand, and ask questions. It's okay to be wrong, you know. Um, and yeah, just go with the go with your curiosity and and be flexible and adaptable because you know, if you'd asked me eight years ago, would this be where I am? I would never have told you this is where I was going to be. I was going to be a clinical psychologist and I was going to have a private practice and I was going to do all these things. And that is not where I am. And I am so happy of where I am. And so be able to adjust, be able to reflect to, I think in in, uh, I'm just going to use my father's quote growing up, go with the flow. Don't, don't put up barriers and blockades to yourself. Um, just figure out what it is and keep going with that flow. Yes, thank God for wonderful parents who encourage us to pursue our own calling. Um, so I think we can move on to the question and answer segment. 
Uh, I have one question from Lamel who asks, what are successful strategies you've either witnessed or employed for measuring the true effectiveness of an initiative? This is open to all panelists, so. So um, I think measuring the true effectiveness can be really challenging, right? Um, if I think about the people that we are typically helping um, who are victims of sexual assault, they don't want their stories told, right? And so, um, we can give out numbers about here are how many items of clothing that we gave out, or here are how many uh, sexual assault victims that we were able to um, support. It is less impactful than having a story of a particular person. And so a lot of times it is working with the different agencies that we work with to build out a uh, conglomerate story because all of us as human beings, we look at statistics and we can kind of go, wow, they have a lot of statistics. But what really touches our heart is when it becomes a story of someone's personal impact. Thank you for that. And Yvonne, can I say, I'm really digging your necklace. <laughs> uh, Elisa, Bridget, uh, does any, one of you want to answer that question before we move to the next? In you terms know, I of, think, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I think for us, I think we, we, use, we ask for a lot of our client feedback. So in evaluating this hard and the impact, but we wanna hear directly from our clients that we're serving of how that is impacting them. Um, and so we do a lot in each of our departments, um, ongoing, we, we do focus groups, we do surveys, we do a variety of different ty types of ways of gathering um, feedback from our clientele because they are the true ones to know if we're succeeding in what we say that we're doing. Um, if they feel like it's had an impact, then we're doing what we need to be doing. Thank you. Um, so the next question is George's who asks, what would you want the public sector to do or not do to facilitate the exciting vision that you're promoting? Again, open to all panelists, so. I think this sort of relates to uh, one of the points we discussed uh, on how the government or the public sector can actually fill these gaps with certain policies. So does any one of you want to maybe dwell at length on that, answer this question? You know, I, um, I did just turn in my ballot. And one of the things that I noticed um, in all of the different propositions was, you know, the number of propositions where we were talking about making decisions about public funding. And that's really challenging. And so um, I'm not sure what I would expect the public sector to do or not do to facilitate this. I think that the reality is I would want them to come to the table and we could like work together on what can they bring, what can private companies bring, what can volunteers bring, what can the NGOs bring? Because frankly, I don't know what the public sector can bring. I need them to come to the table and be ready to like have conversations, be open with curiosity, be willing to say, hey, what could we kind of think about and how could we think outside the box and how could we disrupt things? I don't know what they can bring because I don't really know that sector very well. Bridget or Elisa? 
Um, I have to agree with Yvonne. I think bringing people to the table is important. I think, you know, often policies and ideas are put into place without community, really community input. I think sometimes there's this idea of like community meetings, but they're all at times when people are at work who would, who would actually need to be part of this conversation. Um, and, you know, I, I just think of the, the implementation of the housing pro, of the one system in San Francisco for homeless services. Um, so everyone gets the same assessment. Um, and, you know, we, we were asked to give feedback on this assessment, um, specifically for youth and, you know, six, six months of research of us, like, you know, provide doing kind of a pilot study in our or, own organization and then bringing it to the city and ultimately the, them deciding like, oh no, we're just gonna do the same assessment we do for all adults for the youth. Um, and you know what, this assessment is triggering, it's traumatizing, it's an awful experience for our young people. Um, and so I just really like to see them come and sit at the table and really ask those who are on the ground, is this gonna work or is this not before just implementing ideas? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be redundant. I think it just this what the social sectors and public sectors need to be able to do is look at who's always in the decision making position, who's always at the table, who are the leaders and whose interests and what lived experience do their decisions really reflect and do the work. And those that are in a position to see those gaps and understand that there's different perspectives needed, have the courage to speak up and take a stand for that and really, you know, really get people to think critically around who's informing these policies, who's informing these programs, and are we really listening to the people that we serve and allowing them to co-design initiatives with us? Or are we, again, replicating the same systems of oppression in our best interests of serving people? We're actually causing the same harm that those programs seek to address, much like Elisa is saying. So I don't want to you know, add too much more to that. You did such a beautiful job speaking to that, Elisa. Yeah, thank you for recap recap recapping this. Uh, so last we have Leela's question before we wrap up. Um, do any of you see an increased interest in social innovation since COVID-19 uh, by either public or private sectors? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, I personally, I'm seeing the interest. I'm, you know, I'm always wary again of where is it coming from? Is it coming from a place of authentic desire to serve and solve a social issue? But because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm actually okay with companies and entrepreneurs starting from a, self, a place of self-interest as long as that place of self-interest with the guidance of someone that can help bring a lens of equity and thinking about that moves to a place of impact, I think it's okay to start there. I think most companies at this point have received the memo that they need to be thinking about racial justice, they need to be thinking about equity, they need to be thinking about the impact of their company either on the planet or people. And it's getting to a point, a tipping point, I believe, where most companies understand that they can't be actual leaders in their industries or big players even if, again, just for the purposes of saving face or from P PR perspective, they actually have to have done some work to dis um, innovate around these issues or come up with some statement of some sort around what they're doing. And so I'm in a position where I'm like, guilt and shame are real. And, and, and if there's a sense of like, we need to do more, I'm there to help them figure out how they can do more. And if there's a way for them to take steps that are even further, I see a lot of these conversations happening. Personally, I'm on a mission every single week. I give my time around eight to 12 hours a week to have pro bono consulting advising sessions with white CEOs of tech companies and pharmaceutical and CBD companies. And I use LinkedIn to reach out to them and anybody can do this. They're, they're decision makers. I try, I get them on the phone and I ask them questions about their business. And initially they might try to, they think I'm trying to sell them business coaching, but I'm not actually. Ultimately, often what I'm trying to get them to think critically about is who they do business with, how they do business, how their business impacts people. And is there a way to build in an impact model into their business? And more people are listening now than ever for, for various reasons. Um, I do think we've hit a tipping point um, around racial social justice, thanks to social media, it is not going to go away and people have it in front of them and um, people are confronting these issues and starting to grapple with the responsibility of doing their part. And I think now for however 
painful and challenging a time it is, there is opportunity to leverage the collective sentiment of action and motivation to do something about the issues. And now it, it's like, now's the time. It, it's difficult, I know, and there's a lot of stress on all of us. And again, the collective grief and collective trauma is real and I don't wanna bypass that. And because of that, there are people that are keenly aware and listening more than ever. And um, we've got to leverage the people that are influencers and get them to speak out on these issues and take action and model that for other people. And the one thing I would like to add with, to in addition to what Bridget brought up, I find a lot of hope in that a lot of community groups, a lot of faith communities, a lot of individual citizens in the Bay Area and around the world have decided that it's, it's no longer okay to just let systems go the way it is. It's now time to step up and take action. And so I think we are going to see a real tidal wave of social innovation that is driven by empathy and compassion for the people around us. Uh, Alisa, do you have something to add? I do not. I think I will just highlight what Brigitte said earlier about self-care in all of this. Take care of yourselves. We are all going through a, co co a collective trauma right now, in addition to COVID, but many others. And so please, as you go forward, take care of yourselves. Um, you know, I, I love this one meme that has a cell phone battery that's all the way down. It says, you won't let your cell phone get this low. Don't let yourself get this low. So please recharge your own batteries and take care of yourselves. This, this has been uh, wonderful. And I think uh, it's such a pleasure to talk to very action-oriented practitioners who can speak from their own experience and motivate the rest of us. So thank you to our panelists, uh, Yvonne, Alisa, and Bridget. And of course, everyone else for being able to join us despite well, the circumstances. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I just want to quickly chime in. Um, let's just unmute ourselves and give a round of applause to our amazing panelists. Gotta <laughs> make this experience as real as possible. So there have been so much learning we had from this call. It's just so wonderful and aspirational. And I wanted to just bring out this point where innovation is not only about having a new design, new product, also it's not just about new adoption. It's also, it can also be an uh, innovation in the processes, right? So how do we build new partnership? How do we reinvent way of thinking? So I feel like social innovation have been very comprehensive and we can hear from lots of examples from our panelists. So um, I will give everyone a challenge here. So just highlight your key takeaway from today's um, a panel discussion and put on your social media and hashtag social innovation and hashtag impact circles. Um, and I would love for us to spread the knowledge and spread awareness of social innovation because we need to engage a lot more wider communities into the movement. And then exciting news, we are going to have, as I mentioned, the launch party next month, uh, next week. So we're engaging different stakeholders and especially our members into co-designing, co-creating the new programs, a mentorship program, new events with us. So it's the best time for us to kind of brainstorm and chat about it. And also uh, by the end of the year, so 16th of December, we're going to have a VR experience in our uh, biggest conference um, in collaboration with other partners in Hong Kong and in the Bay Area, and it's called Future City Summit. So I invite everyone to stay tuned to our Facebook page, which I've already added to the, to the chat. So um, thank you everyone, it's such a fantastic discussion. I know lots of people couldn't really make it because of time different or you know, other priorities because of the, the political seeing here, but I will make the recording available for, for everyone through the email that you use to sign up to this email, uh, to, this, to this event, and also the Facebook group. So thank you everyone again. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you again. All right, have a good night. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's so great being on the panel with you, Yvonne and Elisa. And thank you, Sakshina. Thank you, Jesse, for everything you did to put this together. I appreciate it. For sure. Yeah. Thank you, Brihat. Take care, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.